This video is brought to you by Squarespace. As Churchill once said, history is written by victors. And although correct, it's somewhat different with military aircraft. History in the world of aviation is written by those who flew the highest, the farthest, the fastest, or who can blow the most things up. A legendary aircraft writing pages of history books, beloved by the allies and hated by the enemy. A feat of engineering that wasn't made to break any records or perform at any air shows, rather save lives or take them depending on the perspective. This is the story behind the Fairchild Republic A-10 Thunderbolt II, or otherwise known as the Warthog. Today's video is a little bit different. Instead of going play by play in the construction of this amazing aircraft, I'll be going through several fascinating stories about our beloved aircraft. So let's jump into the cockpit with story one, its German roots. During World War II, the whole concept of warfare was changed and all sides of the conflict found out about the importance of air force and air support and its role that it was going to play in the future. It's also where the first true CAS aircraft was born, a close air support aircraft. On the Soviet side, this was the Aleutian Il-2 Strumovic. It became one of the best known aircraft of the war and the most produced plane in the history of aviation. Over 40,000 built. That's pretty crazy stuff. On the other side, and now you're probably all thinking about the Stuka, but it's not the Stuka, at least not yet, but rather the Henschel HS-129. This was a true tank killer of the war and some of the ideas were borrowed from it in the creation of the A-10. For example, this aircraft was defined by its boomstick. It was normally armed with a single 30mm cannon or twin 20mm ones. It could pack a serious punch and destroy almost any armoured vehicle at the time of its early to mid deployment. The Germans went on to install the 75mm full auto variant of the Pac-40 cannon on the HS-129B-3 by the end of the war, but it proved to be very difficult to operate, although extremely effective, being able to destroy virtually any tank of the era. The Junkers U-87 proved to be another legend of the war. And it was actually Hans Ulrich Rudel, the best dive bomber pilot of the war, who is the interest for our A-10 story. Although an amazing pilot, Rudel was a shitty guy and also a Nazi, so don't forget about that, and we certainly don't want to glorify him. But I want to talk about his feats and how that was actually a positive impact on the A-10 development. And it's the U-87G variant that's interesting for us because it was developed specifically as an anti-tank aircraft and it was Rudel himself who suggested mounting twin 37mm cannons in underwing pods because of the previous success of the twin 20mm cannons against earlier Soviet tanks. Now the story of direct Rudel's influence on the A-10 design is a bit of a grey territory and we'd like to stick to the facts here. Some say that he actually participated in the development itself, but that was never confirmed. The only thing we can talk about with a dose of certainty is what Perry Spray, one of the consultants on the design and development of the AX program, which gave birth to the A-10, said and that is how the program was largely influenced by the experiences from both the Vietnam War and Rudel's with the Stuka during the Second World War. It was deducted that a powerful gun and a robustness in combat scenarios would need to be the basis for this new AX design. Why early HS-129s lacked because of the exposed fuel tanks and so the U-87 to a degree. 
It's also interesting to note how the A-10 design is almost an inverted gull wing, just like the U-87 and the F-4U Corsair, which helps the pilot have better visibility of the ground, allow for a larger external bomb load, and carry a big gun. That's right, let's talk about the thing which made this aircraft so popular, the GAU-8. The A-10 fits a small but very important role in the US Armed Forces and has been the winner of many engagements. But if you're looking for an A-10 in your own corner, then you need a Squarespace website. And wouldn't you know it, they also happen to be today's video sponsor. That's right, if you like flying hard and close to the ground, planes that go brrrr, or perhaps are just a aviation fan looking for a website for their business, then Squarespace is the perfect website partner for you. Their sites are already optimized for mobile phones, have the ability to run powerful email campaigns, and they have fantastic e-commerce tech built right into their framework to get you straight up into the air right away. So to launch your own site, go to www.squarespace.com found, and you'll also get 10% off your first site and domain, as well as helping out the channel to make more fantastic animations just like you've been watching today. So genuinely, it really does help just by clicking that link. Anyway guys, back to the brrrr. Remember when we talked about how well that 30mm cannon worked on the HS-129? Well, the GAU-8 is just that multiplied by screeching bald eagle, explosions and freedom. It was created from a completely parallel program to the AX and based on the Gatling design, or simply a rotary cannon with seven barrels providing absolute insane 3,900 rounds per minute. That's 65 shots per second. Obviously, the pilot can only fire in short bursts, so the plane doesn't fall apart and he doesn't spend his 1,200 round total ammo in 20 seconds. What's interesting about this cannon is the fact that the whole design of the aircraft is modified so it could be possible to fit this giant thing inside from the fuselage from the get-go. From the frontal view, you can notice how the landing front gear is offset to the starboard side so there's room for the cannon. This is also done so the recoil forces are centered and the insane recoil itself doesn't move the whole aircraft off the target. Somewhat of a controversial topic is also the use of depleted uranium rounds in the GAU-8. The reason that they use these rounds is that they have better armor-piercing capabilities than standard armor-piercing ammo. However, there are multiple reports about the long-term health issues to the population and combatants in the theaters of war where they were used extensively. But before we move on, let me just point out that this cannon takes around 15% of the aircraft's total weight and a lot of space, as seen here. We're halfway there, so I just wanted to take a little break and ask you guys if you like this, a bit different concept for the video, focusing more on the stories and trivia rather than the usual play-by-play -play of an aircraft's creation. Would you like me to use this to cover more legendary aircraft in the future? Let me know. And now we move on to the third story. Why does everybody love the A-10? With already some 10 years into service, during the Gulf War, the A-10 achieved its legendary status by further cementing it during Operation Iraqi Freedom and during the war in Afghanistan. The Navy hates the Army and the Army hates the Navy and both hate the Air Force guys sipping on their cocktails while the boots on the ground do most of the dirty work. But there is one type of soldier that is universally loved throughout the US Armed Forces and that is the A-10 pilot. We have seen multiple videos of combat footage where an A-10 saves lives of the soldiers on the ground during strafing runs against both soft and armored enemy targets. They can't save in the day again, baby. <laughs> and it's this that created the bond between the branches. 
The A10 can operate very effectively in uncontested airspace, providing close air support to the troops on the ground due to its extremely varied weaponry and robust design. You see, this aircraft was made having in mind the fact that it might be hit by enemy AA fire at all times. Their cockpit is heavily armoured with titanium plates and the fuel is stored behind the GAU-8 ammo, again armoured against the shrapnel damage. There is also a secondary fuel tank if the main ones are leaking, which will provide an additional range of around 370 kilometers, giving the pilot the ability to escape the danger zone before attempting a landing. The aircraft was also made to be very resistant to having parts of the airframe blown off, which you can definitely see in these pictures of some of the damaged A-10s that made it back home. Basically, there is a very high chance of surviving a hit with a man pad, so as we stated before, in uncontested airspace, an A-10 is king of the CAS. At least it was, but we'll get to that in a minute. An A-10 can carry both a laser and GPS guided weapons like a 500 pound GBU-12 bomb or a 2300 pounds GBU-24, or the famous JDAMs. This allows for performing missions from higher altitudes or precision targeting of enemy infrastructure. Loadouts often include dumb bombs on multiple ejector racks like the Mark 82 and the guided AGM-65 Mavericks for use against armor. Depending on the type of mission, A-10s use different pods like Targeting Pod for Laser Guided Weaponry or ALQ-131 ECM pods for jamming and disrupting SAMs, more precisely their radars. But it's also very interesting to note that, as almost always, the A-10 carries twin AIM-9s in its loadout. And this leads us to the very next story, an A-10 in air-to-air -air combat. By now, we've seen all the things the A-10 can do against ground targets, but it may not look it, but this plane is perfectly great at getting air-to-air -air kills. This aircraft actually has a very good turn radius due to its huge aerions, and near the ground, at low speeds, it's a very formidable opponent in a dogfight. A-10 pilots actually go through aerial combat training and they wouldn't be sitting ducks in such a scenario with their two AIM-9s. Although a direct hit with the ultimate doomsday machine under the nose of the aircraft would instantly bring down any enemy. So during the Gulf War, A-10s actually scored two kills against Iraqi Mi-8 helicopters. The first being credited to Captain Bob Swain and being the Chad A-10 pilot he is, he of course shot it down with the Gatlin cannon. In his words, it looked like this. On the final pass, I shot about 300 bullets at him. That's a pretty good burst. The second pass, I put enough bullets down. It looked like I hit him with a bomb. His aircraft was nicknamed the Chopper Popper and entered the pages of the rich A-10 history. But last but not least, let's talk about the future and why the A-10 might not be the best choice for modern conflict. The Warthog has proved to be almost an ideal CAS aircraft throughout the 90s, 2000s and even into the 2010s. But the reign of this king might be coming to an end. You see, the A-10 is a very good aircraft in uncontested airspace, but with the enemy AA systems operational and jets patrolling the skies, it's a rather easy target. During the Gulf War, at the beginning of it to be precise, while the Iraqi Air Force and AA weren't yet completely destroyed, there were several A-10 losses due to ground fire. So the strategy was quickly changed to focus on more precision weapons and high altitude bombing, rather than using them for close up and personal combat. In the Afghanistan conflict, there was no serious anti-air threat. A-10s could operate with their full potential and prove to go unmatched in supporting the troops on the ground in the mountainous and harsh terrain of the country. However, that brings us to today. What changes everything is the modern drone. 
The Turkish Baratar TB2 is proving again and again to be an absolute impressive piece of weaponry, crushing the Armenians in their conflict, inflicting several losses in both Libya and Syria, and being used effectively against the Russians in Ukraine. Even in a very contested Ukrainian airspace, it was shown destroying several AA systems and harassing Russian supply lines, a thing the A-10 would do much better, but probably with many of them being shot down and a guaranteed loss of human life. Relatively cheap UAVs with the crew being completely protected are a game changer and might replace classic attack aircraft like the A-10 and Su-25 into the future. However, the US Air Force decided to leave the A-10s in service, quote, indefinitely, with them rejecting the idea of selling some A-10s to the international customers back in 2015. All of this speaks for itself and explains the legendary status of this aircraft, both in the US Air Force, in the world of aviation, and in the history books. And if you're still here today, thanks so much for watching this love letter to the A-10 Warthog, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did making this video. If you would like to support this more, then we have a Patreon for a small fee you can jump on, see behind the scenes, and chat with me direct.